Hello, I'm Mike Sanborn, and this is a presentation on probably more than you want to know about COVID-19. I'd like to begin by recognizing and appreciating these visual graphics that are available on the internet and what I've done with each one of them in the alt text. I've given their citation as well as in the notes in the original presentation of this. So first off, COVID-19, where did the name come from? Well, it came from a coronavirus uh, disease and it started in the year 2019, so hence COVID-19. Uh, so first, to understand the COVID is to understand uh, viruses in general. And viruses are classified by their morphology, which means shape, and how they replicate. So very briefly, this uh, the HIV virus, um, there's a T4 bacteriophage, it's bacteria, um, influenza virus, uh, adenovirus, um, and there's the tobacco mosaic, and then there's the uh, Ebola virus. And notice some of these RNA, DNA, RNA, DNA, RNA, RNA. So again, the morphology and how they replicate. All right, so first off, viruses are not considered living organisms. Um, they do a lot of things um, by living organisms, but one thing they lack is cells. They do not have cells. They're much smaller than the cell, uh, but they do pretty much everything else. And most notably in the news right now about COVID, they talk about it mutating. Well, what it's doing, it's evolving. Evolving means a change from one generation to the other. Adaptation would be um, with the present organism, but the uh, mutations are, are not non-reversible. They're headed in a particular direction, so hence the virus is evolving before our very eyes. And the quicker something replicates itself, the quicker it evolves. So something like an elephant that uh, has a two-year gestation period would evolve very slowly compared to the virus that has that replicates in a matter of minutes and sometimes seconds. So the definition of a virus is an extremely tiny parasite. So if you remember the symbiotic relationships, um, they're not always mutually beneficial. In this case, the parasite, one is harmed and one is uh, benefited. Uh, and as opposed to altruism, where the one that's harmed does it willing, is willingly accepting the harmfulness, whereas in the parasite, uh, its host is not a willing host. So it's much too small to be seen by any light microscope. Uh, only electron microscopes can bring these into view. So <clears throat> it's an effective agent. Um, it consists of a nucleic acid in the molecule, the DNA and the RNA, and that is contained within a protein coat. So it multiplies only within living hosts, but that doesn't differentiate. Other things, too, only multiply within a, a living host, uh, many uh, bacteria. So the T4 virus, uh, I kind of like it. I equate it to like a lunar lander, um, and in this particular uh, model, it shows that the DNA uh, is encoded, in, encapsulated in what we call a capsid. Uh, so that capsid is just a protein coat. Um, and it has this shaft and base plate and these tail pins. So these tail pins are how it attaches to its victim. So here's a, a quick uh, life cycle of it. So it begins here, and you see the T4s are out there. They haven't attached yet to this bacteria, and this bacteria seems to be pretty much surrounded. So one lucky one manages to connect with the tail, uh, tail fibers, and then it kind of squats down and injects the DNA into the bacterium. At this point, that vessel that carried that DNA is no longer needed. It falls off and uh, disintegrates. So it has two paths here. One is the lysogenic, where it doesn't kill the bacteria. It just kind of inhabits it and produces at a steady rate um, some more T4s. And then there's a lytic one, where it may sit there for quite a while until something triggers it, or it may start right off. It makes many, many parts together, and they assemble. And eventually, they assemble so much that it totally, totally destroys the cell. Okay, so a quick review of the protein synthesis is that the DNA consists of uh, nucleotides, so deoxyribose nucleotide, guanine, cyanine, adenine, thymine. And then the RNA, ribonucleic acid, consists of guanine, cytosine, adenine, but uracil instead of thymine. There's the difference. So nucleotides, generically, they have a phosphate 
a ribose, five carbon sugar, and a nitrogenous base. And they, they combine to form that. And then the nitrogenous base is linked together from phosphate to sugar, phosphate to sugar bond. Our target is to assemble amino acids into a amino acid chain, a peptide chain, and ultimately the complex protein. So the, the code is in the genes. So this particular gene to build this particular protein is triggered at, to open up and from which an RNA can be copied, and that's a reverse image. I like to equate this process to the librarian that has the reference books in the library. The librarian won't let you take out the reference book, but the librarian will let you make a photocopy. So we're making a reverse image with this messenger RNA that can now leave the nuclear library and head off to the ribosomes. And at the ribosome now, it will mate up with a transfer RNA, which will then now describe, transcribe the nuclear code message into the protein. So this transfer RNA is looking for the three-digit, and again, an inverse code. So we were made one inverse, now we're heading back inverse the other way. And it will establish this genetic, the basic sequence to the protein that we're trying to build. So we, we then now, once it's built, once it's done, the transfer RNA goes off and does its business. If it's not needed anymore, it'll get broken down. But the messenger RNA that was originally assembled, it will get broken down back to its basic nucleotides and reassembled later as the cell needs it. It's quite really an amazing process. So once it sequences the protein, um, the protein then goes to the Golgi apparatus for its final build and usually the three-dimensional uh, part of the protein is, is assembled there. So it's a very complex process that's a very natural process. So we'll head off now and discuss the influenza virus very briefly. Um, this doesn't have the neat little tail fibers. It perhaps is much more effective in that you see it has these uh, hemagglutin or little projections that will grab onto the cell. It's the equivalent of the tail fibers being all the way around this round uh, virus. And then it has an enzyme that will then break down the cell uh, membrane in order for it to enter the cell. So here's the flu virus that's attacking a cell. So it, it hangs on to it, releases the enzymes, manages to make its way in. It gets wrapped in the cell membrane uh, as it comes into the cell, heads to the nucleus, and then in, injects it. And basically hijacks our protein synthesis mechanism to build proteins of its own to recreate a new virus which then can exit the cell the same way it came in. It's an amazing process that is it's just joined in and used our own system against ourselves. All right, so now here's the HIV virus. So here's a few terms. Just antigen, that's basically a foreign substance. It's uh, for our viral infections, it would be like a piece of the protein. Uh, that protein that uh, our cells would recognize as being foreign and would attack it. And our, one of our defenders are our leukocytes, our free-moving um, white blood cells. Uh, the term glycoprotein, it's basically a carbohydrate and protein. You see that in the cell membranes, uh, and in this case, the nuclear membrane. Uh, protease, anytime you see ASE at the end, that's a, a an enzyme. And then in the beginning with uh, key you into what it, that enzyme attacks. Um, so this is an enzyme that protease is an enzyme that attacks pro, uh, proteins. Integrase, uh, that would be an enzyme that would then integrate uh, things together, and this case is going to integrate the HIV viral RNA into our DNA. And reverse transcriptase, so that's reversing, it'll change the RNA to the DNA by just simply using our mechanisms to uh, construct and extend onto a uh, chromosome um, in, a, in our DNA. So when the HIV, it comes along, attaches, gets its way in, it's very similar to the other uh, viruses. But what it's doing here, what's different, is that it's going to go to the nucleus 
and then inject its RNA, which then is going to get reversed engineered into our own DNA. And there it may sit in our DNA, and as the cells keep reproducing, cell after cell, will continue to copy that foreign DNA. At some point, maybe right away, maybe never, it'll be triggered to replicate and build new uh, viral HIV, and then they can leave the cell um, and go on to infect others. Other cells within this host, are, if it's transmitted to another person, then infect that person too. And then the Ebola, which has been mentioned a few times lately. Um, this is an incredibly mortal, fatal disease. Uh, the mortality rate is like 90%. If you get it, the odds are you're going to die. Um, so it attacks human immune systems and the organs, uh, and it causes blood clots. That's how it kills people. So Ebola, uh, is a, here it is floating around, ready to attack. It attacks, and what it's doing is it's tricking this white blood cell into eating it, which is this white blood cell's job. It's a foreign subject, so it's going to eat it. But this Ebola virus protects itself against being digested and hijacks the protein synthesis machine. <clears throat> So it can, by several routes, it's, it's, it's instructing several different things to be done here, but one of them is to uh, get into the uh, ribosomes and replicate itself. And then, of course, exit the cell and go on to infect others. So viruses now are transmitted from person to person by several mechanisms. I mean, it can go into the air. Um, it's, and it's on um, water droplets, basically, from our breathing. And if you, it's cold weather, you go outside and you see your exhale. That exhale is the water that's condensing that's normally in our breath anyway. So these viruses, if we're in close contact, will just simply uh, go through the air through the water droplets um, and then land on people. Our noses and our eyes are the primary sources of how these things get into our systems. Uh, we can do it direct contact with the hands, and quite often, you know, th this stuff settles down onto the countertops, tabletops. We touch it, and then we rub our eyes, and we're helping it uh, get. And this one is showing a bed, but it very well could be the countertop at McDonald's or some restaurant, um, or the cash that you were just handed from the. Um, server. Um, so there's many ways to get in. So the COVID symptoms are, are wide and they're not all inclusive. I mean, you may have a fever, you may not. You may be coughing, you may be short of breath, you may just feel tired, sore muscles, headache. Any of these symptoms are possible. Um, and all in all the same thing, a normal flu, any of these symptoms would be possible. And the CDC is constantly, as we're learning more, updating things about this. But in general, if you got any of these things, you should stay home, stay away from others. Uh, this is a neat little uh, chart made by uh, it's an interesting one. Is it shows that um, help prevent, and you know they're talking more and more about vitamin D um, as as helping too. Uh, but anyway, avoid contacts. Wear masks. Stay healthy and basically eat well, have vitamins, wash your hands with soap and water, um, use antiseptic wipes if you don't have that, uh, get vaccinated as soon as you can, uh, wash your fruits, um, watch out for contacts uh, with other things, and disinfect surfaces in your hands and all that. So if you get sick, here's some of the common things you can feel. It's uh, the fever, and along with the fever is the sweating, and, um, runny nose. This is your body's response to almost any type of infection. The idea is somehow you, that what infected you found you as being a nice, favorable place to live, um, but our body's now going to make a switch and say, hey, I'm not such a favorable place to live with these just general responses to try and discourage that infection. And COVID, to help prevent it, here again, is to uh, just clean your, yourself and your hands anything around here, avoid close contact. And we normally do that anyway. You'll try to when we find somebody that's sick. Put distance between yourself and others, cover your mouth, cover your cough and sneeze, <clears throat> clean and disinfect 
frequently. Now, you notice these first six things we should be doing anyway. The CDC recommends with this COVID environment is, of course, to wear the mask, unless you're with somebody that you're with every day, like in your own household. Um, and masks help prevent the COVID fighting from spreading. The basic point of the mask is to keep the droplets from the infected person from getting into the air where they can infect somebody else. There is a slight uh, protection component to wearing a mask, but the primary purpose is to contain the virus within the person that's infected. And we hear an awful lot about people with no symptoms transmitting this disease. So, of course, wear the mask properly. I mean, you're exhaling moisture in your nose, and so many people hold it over the mouth. That's nice because as you talk, you put out bigger water droplets, but still, uh, you're putting out. And you know, we go outside when it's really cold and breathe, and you see the frost uh, that that uh, comes from your nose as well as from your mouth. It doesn't matter. So cover all all of it, and make sure the you're breathing through it. Uh, glasses fogging, uh, which I can't seem to get away from, um, it's just a clear indication that air is, my exhale is leaving over the top of the mask and hitting my glasses. So face masks um, are essential and holding it within, um, but the face shield also adds another barrier. The face shield doesn't contain the virus within the person. But it does protect you from, if you're in an environment where somebody might somehow these droplets get to your eyes directly. Uh, I mean, like I was just at the dentist the other day, and I think a dentist with the drill and all the suction and blowing and stuff would be at a high risk for things blowing directly into their eyes, and the mask would do them nothing for, at that point. And, of course, wear the proper mask. Uh, just a single uh, layer is... Is somewhat effective but not not great two layers all of a sudden almost it's more than doubles the effectiveness uh, the three layer uh, cloth mask you see that it does even better than the medical grade cloth mask uh, and this is what I wear it's uh, it is actually more than three layers to the one I wear and it, it, of course different studies are going to give you different results here in this particular study there but still you can see uh, and you'll find consistency among the studies that at least two layers uh, is what they're looking for. So protecting yourself and others, distance number one. If you're in a room, make sure it's well ventilated. Um, they open windows, uh, but in the wintertime, we're not going to do that. Uh, we have a ventilation system and a HEPA grade filter it is effective and it helps. Uh, but there's no substitute for wearing the mask. So treatment, number one, if you get, if you're sick with COVID or anything, stay home. Don't expose others. So monitor your systems and and watch out um, for difficulty breathing. This is what what's killing most of the people is this uh, inability to get the air. So along with that would be chest pain, confusion. Confusion comes, I don't know if you saw the movie Apollo 13, when they were worried about uh, the uh, astronauts having too much carbon dioxide in their capsule uh, and becoming confused. Uh, you got to get rid of the carbon dioxide from your lungs as well as take in the oxygen. And if you don't get rid of the carbon dioxide, the, the symptom is um, that confusion. Uh, my, my sister smokes, and then when she was having a, a um, crisis uh, with her lungs, uh, she was very, very confused and barely recognized me. So the, the lungs are very important and very, very vulnerable to injury. So inability to stay awake is also related to, and blue lips, those are both related to the low oxygen levels. And again, they're saying this may not be all the symptoms the CDC is putting a disclaimer there. So how it kills with your lungs, so your lungs from the trachea to the bronchi bronchi bronchioles all the way down, and finally it gets to the air sac. So oxygen enters. Uh, oxygen doesn't go directly to the cell. It must first come into solution, and that's what the mucus lining here is for. 
and the, and the reverse of that is the carbon dioxide must come out into that solution and then into the air. So what affects the oxygen solubility, temperature works against us. Gases don't like to go into solution at high temperatures. Um, the atmospheric pressure and um, the concentration. So that's the first thing they'll do for somebody in distress for not being able to get enough oxygen would be to add oxygen and up, up the concentration. And then those that go on to the respirators, um, they basically they're increasing the pressure as well as the concentration to try to get that oxygen into solution so then it can cross the cell membrane. <clears throat> so what's working against us with the diseases is number one is the mucus builds up. That's one of our body's responses to try to keep the disease out is to build up that mucus. So that's thickening the layer uh, and slowing the oxygen absorption. And the other one is if it actually damages the cells, the cell membranes cannot absorb the oxygen then. And again, if you're a smoker with pre-existing conditions, you already have tar building up in here to uh, slow the oxygen absorption as well as killing some of the cells and ultimately killing the entire alveoli. Okay, so those were the pulmonary effects, the lung effects on the lungs. There's other outside extra pulmonary other than lung infections. So the kids that are the younger ones that are talking about the multi inflammatory syndrome or Kawasaki's disease, it basically shows multi system shutdown. So it can have some effects, neurological effects, the dizziness, and of course that could be secondary to the low oxygen. It could have some effects on the kidneys where you start to see uh, proteins in the urine, and which is the classic kidney damage. Um, and then hematuria, that's um, blood in the urine, uh, hepatic diseases, um, gastrointestinal, stomach flu, and things like that. Thromboembolisms, this is blood clots, cardiac heart problems, uh, problems with the hemoglobin uh, endocrine system. Um, so diabetic problems, um, similar to diabetics. So if you already have diabetes, that makes that when we talk about vulnerable populations. And then many skin dermatological disorders you can see with, uh, with the COVID. So these may be, and what they're fearing now, and is a long ways from being studied uh, thoroughly here, is that these may be some long, uh, is it the con conditions that last well beyond being the infection of the virus. When the virus is long gone, you may have some permanent heart damage. So treatments. So they're talking about this monoclonal where they get antibodies from somebody else and give it to someone. This is can be done only in the hospital through an IV and it's not a recommended treatment. Um, Rindesivir, um, that's coming out. It's an extremely expensive, like $3,000 per dose. Um, but it does inhibit the RNA replication of that virus. And then there's a general treatment of, of the steroids, the cortical steroids, which basically acts like adrenaline to put the body into overdrive in order to help try to fight that infection. The National Institutes of Health have put together this chart for guidelines. Um, it starts here in this, in this hierarchy. So the lower uh, risk, if you have uh, only minor symptoms, of course, is just to stay home. Uh, take care of yourself like you would with any, um, any flu. Um, then the next step, of course, would be uh, hospitalization. Um, they're talking about severe at this point. Um, requiring additional oxygen and then ultimately of course the respirator where they put the person unconscious so they don't reject this thing stuck in their throat in order to increase the pressure and uh, mechanical breathing for the patient. Okay, so this is just a, an overview of the timeline of what we're they're, uh, trying to do now with uh, combating this COVID-19 disease. The First, of course, we look at what we already have in, in stock, the hydroxychloroquine um, that was talked about um, is uh, an anti-inflammatory. It's since been ruled out, but the corticosteroids, they definitely are among these repurposed drugs, uh, stuff we already have in the arsenal that we can use. Uh, antibody theory, a therapy they're looking at, um, and they're probably pretty well 
going towards the vaccines now. So there's 43 different vaccines, which I found amazing here. Um, and as, as they start coming on to the news more and more, um, so there shouldn't be any surprise. So there's, a, there's a lot of people working on this um, to help uh, with the need. So again, a reminder that vaccines and it, typically were just a uh, piece of the, the protein. We can't say it was a dead, dead virus. Um, inactive we talked about uh, for viruses so and then it's just a piece of it but there was always a risk of getting the whole virus and, and an, an inactive virus with a vaccine which, uh, which is rare but it's it could happen um, so the body identifies this this foreign body um, so the macrophage of the white blood cells um, first line first uh, soldiers up to bat here um, they would just simply eat that virus and hopefully digest it the uh, beta or B lymphocytes, <clears throat> these are white blood cells that produce antibodies and, that attack and basically gum up the virus so that it can't uh, penetrate the cell. And then the T lymphocytes, they will eat our own cells that have not gotten infected. So basically they, they um, cannibalize our cells in order to uh, prevent the virus from getting any further. So the mRNA vaccines that they're talking about, uh, basically it's uh, it's using our, again, it, since the virus has hijacked this system, the, it's very clever that they're using our, our uh, protein building system to protect ourselves. So basically the, the vaccine is a messenger RNA that will build that protein, that antigen, that piece of the virus um, that our body will now recognize as being a foreign substance so it will kick in our immune system in order to uh, uh, build antibodies against this invading which isn't which is invading that we duplicated ourselves within our own cells so so it is this it's very clever in that we never ever get any part of the original virus. Uh, they simply have done the uh, DNA uh, sequencing of the virus and uh, reconstructed only a piece of it uh, to inject into us. So the different mRNA vaccines would be different because they're using different parts of that protein. It wouldn't all be identical. So you couldn't take, for instance, the vac mRNA vaccine from one company for your first dose, and then a vaccine from a, the other company for your second dose. It'd be like getting two first doses. You still got to come up with a follow-up of the same company, the same mRNA sequence. So just to put it in perspective, we get vaccinated for lots of things, um, and not necessarily everything on this list. So you know, most of us don't need to get vaccines against anthrax. If we were headed into a, an environment where anthrax uh, poisoning could be a possibility, then it would be a um, good idea. Our sewer systems for uh, cholera, uh, it's not necessary to be, but if we were headed to a third world country where they didn't have good sewer systems, you might want to get vaccinated from the cholera. So we do get the DTP uh, vaccine, um, yeah, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Uh, you'll see redundancy in this list. This is the CDC list, by the way. Um, the MMM, RV, measles, mumps, measles, rubella. So see, that shows up here several times, the DTPT. Um, polio vaccine. I'm not so sure that we're getting that anymore. Polio has been pretty well under control. Um, so I noticed that the rotavirus and seasonal influenza virus, these things are changing all the time. Um, Viruses is evolving, so they don't know which strain is going to be coming. So, uh, then the, the uh, varicella is uh, chickenpox, and pertussis is a whooping cough. And we do get those regularly. Uh, it could be, the pertussis could be fatal, for, especially for younger children. All right, so that's what I have. I hope it helps you. Stay safe and follow the guidelines.